Welcome everybody to another program of the National World War II Museum and the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping with some technical reminders for those of you joining us on Zoom. Uh, you are participants, so that means you do not have video or microphone privileges like you would in a traditional Zoom meeting, but you will be able to interact through the Q&A box. To find that, you can hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and uh, look at the Zoom menu options. If you'd like to ask any questions of our panelists tonight, please just type them in and our moderator will get to them, uh, get to as many as possible through the Q&A session, which will follow the presentation. If you miss any part of this evening's program, remember you can always watch it or re-watch it on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining us. And now it's my pleasure to pass the program to the museum's Senior Director of Public Programming, Dr. Ed Langle. Ed? Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here this evening for what will be a fantastic program. I'm delighted to welcome Janet Conant, who is an accomplished author, who is also a granddaughter of James Bryant Conant, who was an administrative director of the Manhattan Project and one of our nation's leading scientists of the 20th century. She's the author of New York Times bestsellers, uh, The Irregulars, Roald Dahl and the British Spy Ring in Wartime Washington, and Tuxedo Park, A Wall Street Tycoon and the Secret Palace of Science that Changed the Course of World War II. She'll be speaking tonight about her new book, The Great Secret, The Classified World War II Disaster, that launched the war on cancer. Jenny, thank you for joining us. Ed, thank you. Uh, I also want to thank the museum for inviting me to be with you tonight. Alas, it's virtually, but I'm going to do my best. It's my first Zoom presentation, so bear with me, everyone. I've had a lot of coffee, and I'm thinking about right now that I should have had a lot of wine. But anyway, <laughs> here we go. I'm going to start us off with a quote from Winston Churchill. Um, he had a way with words. And he once observed, men occasionally stumble across the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Francis Alexander, the remarkable hero of my book, did not hurry off. In fact, he refused to leave the scene of a military disaster, even when Churchill himself warned him to. He stayed, he paid attention, he investigated, and as a result, he recognized the never before seen symptoms in a group of dying sailors that might have life saving implications for others in the future. This is the story of one intrepid army doctor's alert mind and how it turned a chemical weapons report into a stepping stone and a horrific World War II tragedy into a medical triumph. I'm going to take you back to the night of December 2nd, 1943. The old port town of Bari on Italy's Adriatic coast was bustling. The British had taken the capital in September, and though the front lay only 150 miles to the north, the medieval city, with its massive cliffs cradling the sea, had escaped the fighting almost unscathed. Only a few miles outside of town, lines of women and children were begging for black market food. But in Bari, the shops were full of cakes and bread and rolls. Young couples strolled arm in arm like in the old days, and ice cream vendors were doing a brisk business. Bari was a critical Mediterranean service hub, and the Allied forces had made sure it stayed protected. It was supplying both the American 5th and British 8th armies, which comprised the better part of the 500,000 Allied troops engaged in driving the Germans out of Italy. And we can show that first slide of the, of the Bari waterfront. The liberating British Tommies had already chased the Nazis from the skies over Italy, and the British who controlled the port were so confident they had won the air war that Marshal Sir Arthur Cunningham announced that it was all but immune from attack. I would regard it as a personal affront and insult if the Luftwaffe should attempt any significant action in this area, he announced earlier that day. The busy wartime port was teeming with activity. 
Four days earlier, the American Liberty ship John Harvey had pulled in with a convoy of nine merchantmen. 30 Allied ships were cramming the harbor, packed against the seawall, nose to nose along the pier. Their holds were laden with everything from food and medical gear to engines, corrugated steel for landing strips, and tons of fuel oil for the, for the planes. You could see on the upper decks were tanks, armored personnel carriers, jeeps, ambul ambulances, everything. Bright lights winked atop huge cranes that were hoisting equipment out. The dockyards were working around the clock to unload the supplies for the next big push, the advance on Rome. The Allied strategy hinged on making steady progress up the rugged mountainous peninsula of Italy and culminating in proposed amphibious attack at Anzio, about 32 miles south of Rome. The success of the advance depended on the long supply lane lines sustaining the men's march northward. Because of the absolute urgency to keep the incoming stream of war material moving to where it was needed most, the usual blackout orders were suspended. The lights blazed in Bari Harbor all night long. At 7.35 p.m., a blinding flash was followed by a terrific bang. The ancient port's single anti-aircraft battery opened fire. Then came an ear-splitting explosion, and then another and another as the German Junkers Ju-88s flew in low over the town, dropping bombs. Smoke and flames rose from the city's winding streets. The lead pathfinders had dropped duple or window, a new kind of jamming technique using foil strips designed to confuse Allied radar. And as a result, they achieved almost complete surprise. As the incendiaries rained down on the harbor, it turned night into day. Gunners aboard the anchored ships scrambled to shoot down the enemy, but it was too late. There was virtually no opposition. The attacking German planes pulled out, unchallenged by Allied fighters. Although the raid lasted less than 20 minutes, the results were devastating. A tremendous roar came from the harbor. An exploding ammunition tanker sent a huge rolling mass of flames a thousand feet high. A reporter for Time magazine described a fiery panorama. Eight ships were burning fiercely. The entire center of the harbor was covered with burning oil, he reported. A ruptured fuel line sent thousands of gallons gushing into the harbor where it ignited into a gigantic sheet of flame, engulfing the entire north side of the port. Like a prairie fire, the flames spread across the surface of the water, leaping from ship to ship. The crews worked frantically to save their vessels before the raging fires forced them to jump, swim for safety. The distant cries of men yelling for help echoed in the ruined harbor. News of the night raid on Bari, one of the worst naval catastrophes of the war, was heavily censored. General Dwight Wee Eisenhower's first communique from Air Force headquarters in Algiers on December 4th stated only that damage was done. Adding insult to injury, the first real account of the air raid came from the Germans. A Berlin propaganda broadcast on December 5th gloated over the mission's spectacular success stating that the crowded harbor was so poorly protected that German bombers had been able to pick off the Allied ships like sitting ducks. The sneak attack on Bari, which the press dubbed the Little Pearl Harbor, shook the complacency of the Allied forces, who had been convinced of their air superiority in the, in the area. All told, the Nazis sunk 17 Allied ships and destroyed more than 31,000 tons of vital cargo. More than 1,000 American and British servicemen were killed outright, and almost as many wounded, and an untold number of civilians. Rumors abounded that officials were covering up an embarrassing incident. There was talk of a new German secret weapon, a rocket-driven glide, glide bomb. Congressional concern over the debacle was underscored by Eisenhower's announcement that he had asked a special Senate subcommittee to investigate. Rear Admiral Emery Scott Land, responsible for U.S. merchant marine fleet across seven seas, angrily told Time magazine, you're going to hear more about that raid before you hear less. But that was the last official word on the matter, and the Bari incident remained shrouded in mystery. In the crucial days that followed, 
the task of treating the gravely injured sailors would be made even more difficult by wartime secrecy and the determined efforts of the American and British government to cover up the incident so as not to endanger preparations for the most important operation of the war, Overlord, the Allied invasion of German-occupied France, planned for the spring. It would be almost 30 years before the world would learn the truth about what really took place on that fatal night. And even today, few are aware of the surprising consequences of the disaster and its impacts on the lives of millions of Americans. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander was asleep in his headquarters. He was awake at the first jangle of the telephone. The summons came in the middle of the night. There appeared to be a developing medical crisis in Bari. Too many men were dying too quickly of unexplained causes. The symptoms were unlike anything the local military physicians had seen before, and they had begun to suspect the Germans had used an unknown weapon, perhaps poison gas. With the number of mysterious deaths increasing rapidly with each day, the British placed a red alight call alerting Air Force headquarters in Algiers, Allied headquarters in Algiers. There was an urgent request for assistance. Alexander was dispatched immediately to the scene of the disaster. He looked young for a combat physician. He was five foot eight and skinny, only 29. His hair was thinning at the temples and that lent him the only air of authority he could claim. He was popular with the troops, though some patients kidded him that his gentle bedside manner was best suited to a pediatrician. But he was tougher than he looked. He had been through the brutal invasion of North Africa under Major General George S. Patton. And despite his quiet modesty and dimples, Alexander had proven himself to be competent, determ determined, and resourceful. His superiors knew he had a good head on his shoulders. He could have sat out the war in a stateside hospital, but the desire to serve ran deep in his family. He was descended from self-made immigrants who had fled famine and persecution in Europe for the United States in the 1880s and were forever grateful for the opportunities afforded them in their new home. Alexander's father was a popular family doctor in Park Ridge, New Jersey, and it was his one ambition to follow in his father's footsteps. He had excelled at Staunton Military Academy and entered Dartmouth at 15, a standout. He was allowed to advance directly to medical school and graduated at the top of his class in 1935. He earned his MD at Columbia. After completing his residency, he went back home and hung out his shingle next to his father's, full of pride. But in the spring of 1940, as Hitler began his march across Europe, Alexander volunteered for duty. He felt strongly that this was a war in which he had to participate. He noticed, notified his local draft board that he would be available at any time. He was called up in November and spent time with the 16th Infantry Regiment stationed at Gunpowder Creek in Maryland, which is not far from Edgewood Arsenal, which also happened to be home to the Chemical Warfare Service. Before long, he decided to contact the Chemical Warfare Service with an innovative new design he'd come up with for spectacles that could fit inside the face piece of a gas mask. It just happened that Alexander suffered from extreme myopia. He was, he was very nearsighted and actually flunked his first physical. When the army doctor went back to shuffle some papers, he quickly memorized the first few lines on the eye chart, talked him into giving him the test again and passed. But he was pretty fearful that if there was a gas attack during the war, he'd have to choose between wearing his glasses and the gas mask because the gas masks, which were left over from the previous war, didn't fit over his glasses. So he came up with a new design. It so impressed his superiors at the Chemical Warfare Service that they offered him a job. Transferred to Edgewood Arsenal, he underwent a crash course in poison gases. And in the hurried pace of the war, he became a newly minted expert in the field. He conducted all kinds of experiments on animals to evaluate toxic agents and develop new forms of treatment and protective gear for soldiers. After Pearl Harbor, he started traveling around the country to different training camps to teach army medical personnel how to treat chemical casualties. He was promoted to director of the Chemical Warfare Service's Medical Research Laboratory. And so when General Eisenhower, concerned about the heightened threat that Hitler might launch a gas attack in Europe. 
He requested a doctor with a chemical warfare background and young Alexander was sent to Air Allied Force Headquarters in Algiers. So now at 5 p.m. on December 7th, 1943, five days after the attack on Bari, Alexander's plane touched down on the battered airfield. Waiting for him were a group of senior British doctors. He could see that they were immediately agitated and he was taken to the hospital at once, he wrote in his diary. The situation was grim. All the equipment for five planned American field hospitals had been sunk in the air raid. Fortunately, all the doctors were safe and they scrambled to open the 26th American General Hospital the morning after the raid, borrowing beds and bandages from the Italians to help care for the scores of bombing victims. I think we have a picture of the hospital. Alexander knew the lack of medical supplies, however, was gonna compound the tragedy. The existing hospitals in Bari were run by the British. By some miracle, the largest, the 98th General Hospital, had been spared, but the place had taken a beating. The doors were wrenched off hinges, windows were shattered, and the bricked up uh, walls scattered their bricks like hail. A concussion blast, blast had knocked out the power, so they were working by lamplight. They were still sweeping up the glass when the first of the wounded began to arrive. Hundreds and hundreds of bloodied and battered sailors suffering from shock, burns, and exposure. Almost all of them were covered in thick black crude oil. The litter bearers brought up the rear, carrying the, the most seriously injured. These were the sailors who had jumped from blazing ships or swum, swum through pools of flaming oil and were horribly burned. A death ward was set up in the empty back room for those beyond help. In the basement, a makeshift mortuary, a local carpenter was knocking together rough pine coffins as fast as he could. The town ran out of caskets in only the first few hours. With so many patients needing urgent attention, there was no time to get most of the wounded sailors out of their dirty clothes, so the nurses did what they could. The immersion cases, the shivering boys who had been fetched from the freezing water, received the standard emergency treatment for the time, a shot of morphine, blankets to keep them warm, and strong, hot, sweet tea. Then they were left to rest. A few complained of smarting eyes and stinging burns, but that was attributed to the large fires and fuel oil, and they were discounted at the time. Most just lay there quietly, aware the surgical cases would be given priority. The first unusual indication, the doctors told Alexander, was that the casualties did not seem to present typical symptoms or respond in the typical manner. At dawn, the nurses observed that men complained of being thirsty. Suddenly, they started ripping off their clothes and bandages in a frenzy, complaining that their skin was on fire. Overnight, the majority of the immersion cases had developed red inflamed skin and blisters as big as balloons. This, together with widespread nausea and vomiting, led the doctors to think the cause might be the poisonous fumes from the fuel oil perhaps the explosives. But six hours after the attack, patients began complaining of severe eye pain. By the end of the day, the wards were full of hundreds of men with their eyes swollen shut. As the staff's unease deepened, headquarters sent notification that there was a possibility of a blister gas exposure. But the information was vague and unconfirmed. The hundreds of burn patients with unusual symptoms were to be classified dermatitis NYD, not yet diagnosed, pending further instructions. Given the crush of casualties that first night, the non-urgent patients who appeared in good condition were sent away. Most of them were still in their wet uniforms. The next morning they returned, clearly needing treatment. They were in a horrible state. What made it worse was that so many of the boys were conscious throughout their ordeal. Warren Brandenstein, a young gunner aboard the American Liberty ship, the John Bascombe, could not understand why his vision was becoming blurrier with each passing hour. That's when the rumors about the poison gas started to spread, he recalled. He remembered feeling uneasy when an official looking group came through the hospital ward and confiscated all the clothes, shoes, belts, uniforms, everything. There was no explanation given. That created a panic among the patients, he said. They feared their fates were sealed. 
The first unexplained death occurred at 18 hours after the attack. Within two days, there were 14. Alexander noted the startling downward spiral of the patients. Boys that appeared in rather good condition in a matter of minutes would become moribund and die. The British doctors were mystified. The symptoms did not fit any of those in their case histories of poison gas from World War I. They could find no similarities in the middle medical textbooks or the manuals issued by the Chemical Warfare Service. If the toxic agent was mustard gas, so named because of its unpleasant garlicky odor, then respiratory complications sh should have been more prominent, but they weren't. As Alexander walked the crowded wards, he examined the patients. He gently lifted blankets to study their burns. With extraordinary delicacy, he probed the raised, thickened red skin. He spoke with each man in turn, asking him how he'd come by his injuries. Which ship was he on? How did he come to be rescued? Did he receive any first aid on the docks? What about when he got to the hospital? One sailor after another told of being caught in the firestorm, of the pandemonium that followed, of somehow making it to the hospital. There they had waited for as long as 12 and even 24 hours in their wet uniforms before receiving treatment. Drawing back the covers on one patient, Alexander studied the burns on the otherwise healthy, muscled body. The sailor said he had been aboard a PT boat in the harbor when the German bombers flew over. He heard a loud boom and felt a spray of oily liquid land on his neck. A picture of the injuries is shown in Alexander's report. He observed the outline of red, raised skin, shiny with ointment, delineating where he'd been sprayed as if the splash had been imprinted, imprinted on his flesh. The burns Alexander had seen on other patients were varied, but already, he could distinguish between chemical burns and thermal burns, those caused by fire and heat. Certain patterns were present, depending on how the individual had been exposed, he wrote. It appeared to Alexander that sailors been thrown overboard and completely immersed in the harbor were burned extensively over 90% of their bodies, while those in boats had comparatively superficial burns wherever the toxic soup had hit them. Some men who had sat in the solution, possibly in lifeboats, had only local burns of the buttocks and groin. And a few lucky souls who had taken upon themselves to wipe off the oily mixture that first night had only minor injuries. As he made his rounds, it was increase increasingly clear to Alexander that most of the patients had been exposed to a chemical agent. He had noticed something from the first moment he entered the hospital. There was some odor that just kept nagging away at him and he could pick it up at, at various places in various rooms and it stood out from the usual smells of urine and disinfectant and burned flesh. The odor that implanted itself in his mind, he wrote in his diary, was mustard gas. It had been five days since the initial exposure and there was any chance of saving the lives of the hundreds of, sa of sailors lying in beds, plus the countless Italian civilians. He knew he needed to act very swiftly. He decided to question the hospital director, direct, director and put, him, put the question to him. He had his own suspicions, so he asked, I feel these men may have been exposed to mustard in some manner, Colonel. Do you have any idea how this might have happened? None, came the hospital director's reply. As the chemical warfare consultant at AFHQ, Alexander was cleared to the highest degree. He knew the Allies had begun secretly stockpiling poison gas in the Mediterranean in case Germany, with its back to the wall, resorted to chemical warfare. But he was skeptical that the Allies would have shipped mustard shells into a busy port like Bari, so close to the local population and then allowed the toxic cargo to sit there as a prime target for an enemy strike. Still, he couldn't afford to rule it out. He tried again. Have you checked with the port authorities? Have you checked the shipping mass? Could the ships in the harbor have been carrying mustard? He was told again and again that they did not have the information, that it was not possible. But Alexander had his doubts. It sounded to him like the British were trying to manage his investigation. He did not believe he was getting the full story or their full cooperation. The burden of proof, he realized, rested on him. He ordered a series of tests for the patients who were still alive 
and insisted on a series of careful and complete autopsies of those who died under mysterious circumstances. He ordered samples of the harbor water collected and analyzed. He borrowed personnel from displaced American hospital units and put them to work gathering data, performing lab tests on tissue samples, and compiling pathology reports. Suspecting that the British officials were dodging his question, Alexander visited the Navy House, the British Admiralty's local headquarters. Again, he demanded to be told that there was mustard gas in Bari Harbor. Again, it was absolutely denied. He left unconvinced. What he needed was proof. But he also knew something else. This was a new horror, he wrote, not the familiar menace he had studied at Edgewood Arsenal. This was mustard gas poisoning through a different guise than that recognized from World War I. The first thing the next morning, Alexander scouted the harbor. He wanted to do his own investigation with as little official interference as possible. He picked his way through the mounds of rubble and surveyed the twisted me metal. He looked at the burnt out vessels. that had been Some of them had been towed out to sea. Some of them could still be seen. Their masts broken, poking above the water. A coal barge still smoldered in the cave close by and the fly ash stung his nostrils. The dark oil slime water in the harbor looked sinister. One sailor had recalled that the floating oil had been a foot thick on the surface of the water after the raid. It was a mixture of high octane gasoline and fuel from two dozen allied ships and Alexander suspected mustard gas. But he did not know what else might be in there. He hated to do more tests. He knew that the allied cargo ships had been carrying white phosphorus shells he knew that they had been carrying a new secret weapon called napalm. He could, be not, he could not be sure what was in the chemical stew. He also could not be sure if it was not a German aerial gas attack. In a spray attack, he reasoned that liquid mustard would in most cases be transformed by the slipstream into tiny droplets resembling a vapor. It would have contaminated all the ships in the inner harbor, including the crippled, crippled vessels that still remained afloat and drenched all the men on the docks below. Even men not on the water would have inhaled significant doses of the noxious vapor as it spread across the harbor, some of it sinking, some burning, some mixing with the tons of oil floating on the surface, and some evaporating in the clouds of smoke and flame. Yet Alexander could find no evidence of mustard contamination. When he questioned the Royal personnel, the Royal Navy personnel on the docks, they seemed surprised. They shook their head. No mustard had been released in the air raid, they told him. That's impossible. There's no mustard here. When he spoke to the British port authorities, they continued to state categorically that there was no mustard in the area. But undeterred, Alexander described in detail the ghastly burns he had seen. He insisted there was no way those injuries could have been sustained by anything but chemical exposure. Of the 534 men admitted to the Allied hospitals just in the first night. 281 were suffering from severe symptoms consistent with mustard, and in one day, 45 had died. He told the British they could expect far more fatalities. The vast majority were their own countrymen. Were they happy about that? At that point, the port authorities began to waver and change their story. They began to say that perhaps there was mustard gas in the harbor but it could only have come from the Germans. Shocked by this sudden about face, Alexander reconsidered. He did some more studying of the papers and the ramifications of the charge that Hitler, in a desperate gamble, had risked a gas offensive. But in the end, after reviewing all the evidence, he discounted it as unlikely. Coming after the authorities' strong denials of so much as a whiff of gas in Bari, he thought it was too neat an explanation of what had happened which he now suspected was something much more complicated. Over the next two days, he pored over the clinical records and autopsy reports. Reading the reports he wrote is to take a journey into the nightmare of the effects of chemical contamination. He came to an overwhelming conclusion. The serious consequences of mustard gas could be seen on most of the victims. Even though they were bruised by blast and the explosions, the chemical exposure was apparent. Alexander was not sure how to proceed when he received stunning news. A diver he had ordered to search the harbor floor had found fractured gas shells. 
Tests were immediately performed on site and revealed traces of mustard. The ordnance officers from the US Air Force identified the casings as belonging to a 100 pound M47A2 mustard gas bomb. German mustard gas bombs were always marked with a distinctive gelb kreutz or yellow cross. The bombs were definitely American. His instincts had been right all along. One of the ships in the harbor had been carrying mustard gas. The secret shipment had most likely been destined for a chemical stockpile at Foggia, 75 miles away, in order to improve the US capability to retaliate in the event of a German gas attack. Alexander knew that the bombs were fragile and would have been fractured by the explosions in the bombing raid. Using a sketch of the harbor that he had prepared as part of his investigation, he, he plotted the positions of the sunken ships and by correlating them with the number of, of mustard gas victims for each ship, he was able to pinpoint the jo John Harvey, an American Liberty ship, as the epicenter of the explosion. Alexander found it hard to believe that the British officials did not know of the John Harvey secret cargo. The circumstances of the accident now demanded further investigation. And he would have to explore the extent to which the military authorities had covered up the escaped gas. By failing to alert the hospital staff to the risk of contamination, they had greatly added to the number of fatalities. But in the immediate moment, his first concern was the patients. Now that he actually knew that his suspicions were confirmed and it was mustard gas, he advised the hospital staff how to treat the patients for mustard exposure and try to reduce the number of deaths over the next couple of days. Instead of bringing matters to a close, Alexander's discovery that the mustard gas had come from the Allies' own supply made a difficult job that much more complicated. The British port officials' attempts to obfuscate rankled, but that paled in comparison to their effort to shift responsibility to the Luftwaffe. It was not a harmless fabrication. Alexander worried that if they were gonna accuse the Germans of dropping mustard when the Germans had not done so, it could have grave political implications. The previous year, President Roosevelt had issued a warning that any German use of chemical weapons would be followed by the quote, fullest possible retaliation. Churchill had echoed his remarks. The significance of any error in interpreting the factor or source of mustard gas in Bari, Alexander knew, could be horrendous. If the Allied leaders drew the faulty conclusion that Germans had deployed chemical weapons, then it could provoke Hitler into launching a gas attack, and then they would have an all-out chemical war. Adding to his anxiety, the daily death toll was, raising, was rising rapidly. He decided he had to notify officials of what his findings were and he cabled Allied Force Headquarters in Algiers. The burns in the hospitals in this area labeled dermatitis NYD are due to mustard gas, he wrote. They are unusual and the varieties, most of them are due to mustard, which has been mixed in with the surface oil and therefore went undiagnosed. He was feeling a growing sense of urgency and he awaited the replies. He sent high priority cables to both the American president and the British prime minister, informing them of the nature of the casualties at Bari and the almost certain origin of the gas on an American ship. Roosevelt accepted his findings and responded, please keep me fully informed. Churchill, however, sent a terse reply. He did not believe there was mustard gas in Bari. Alexander was speechless. He admired Churchill, but he realized that he had to question the leader's command decision. He realized that Churchill was mostly concerned that if he acknowledged there was poison gas in the area and the Germans retaliated, the first place they would be dropping gas would be on England. So Alexander sent a second telegram. He again cited his findings at much greater length, stating that beyond any doubt, these casualties were due to mustard. But he was informed that Churchill maintained that the quote, symptoms do not sound like mustard gas. His instructions were the same to the doctor, re-examine the patients. Flummox, an unsure how a lonely American medical officer was supposed to respond, Alexander appealed to a liaison officer for advice. 
the British officer advised him, one did not argue with the prime minister. After a sleepless night, Alexander returned to the hospital determined to prove his diagnosis was correct. Churchill was undoubtedly brilliant and he had an uncanny, for the, uncanny instinct for the salient fact. He had put his finger on the most important question about the Bari victims. Why were the toxic effects so much more serious than ever in recorded history? Far more patients were dying of mustard at Bari than on the battlefields of World War I, where the fatality rate had been around 2%. The death rate in Bari was six times higher in climbing. The difference, he believed, was from the unprecedented, intimate, and lengthy contact as a result of being immersed in the oily harbor of water and then left to sit in soaked uniforms. The individuals, to all intents and purposes, were dipped into a solution of mustard and oil, wrapped in blankets, given warm tea, and allowed a prolonged period for absorption, he wrote. If the survivors had been hosed down, given fresh clothes, they would have had a fair chance of survival. Instead, the men had been allowed to maritate, marinate in their mustard-soaked uniforms for hours. It had been tantamount to a death sentence. But military secrecy had taken precedence. The various British and American officials who knew of the poison gas shipment on the John Harvey had been reluctant to release the highly classified information. There was plenty of blame to go around, but the bottom line was that no official gas warning was given to the hospitals. The cover-up and the stonewalling, Alexander concluded, came from not wanting to admit that errors in judgment had been made. But by then he had made himself a nuisance and Bari officials wanted him gone. He was warned that if he did not stop insisting on his diagnosis of mustard gas, he risked court-martial. But although his investigation into the Bari disaster was over, his medical inquiry had only just begun. As he sat reviewing the case sheets and pathology reports, one recurring observation leapt out at him, the devastating effects of mustard on the patient's white blood cells. As he flipped through the records, he saw it again and again, the white blood cell counts fell sharply off. He noted that the lymphocytes, the white blood cells found in the lymph organs and of importance to the immune system were the first to disappear. What he saw made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. He had seen these exact results before, but never in humans. In March, 1942, when he was training at Edgewood, they had received sampled, smuggled samples of German nitrogen mustard gas and had begun experimenting it. The studies had recorded bizarre effects and to their astonishment, the white blood cell count of the rabbits they were experimenting on dropped to zero or points very close to zero. No one at the lab had ever seen such rapid destruction of white blood cells in test animals or the accompanying deterioration of lymph nodes and bone marrow. They researched the literature but could find no reports. It was a shocking kind of reduction of white blood cells known as leukopenia and they had never seen anything that had had the same effect. Alexander's first impulse was that they had a bad batch of rabbits, but when they repeated the experiments time and again, the results were the same. Each time they achieved the same dramatic effects, sudden severe leukopenia, severe lymphopenia, lymph node depletion, and marrow depression. After exposure, the white blood cell counts rapidly disappeared and the lymph nodes were left as shrunken little shells. Alexander was fascinated by the impact of mustard on the body. Because of the dramatic and reproducible effects, he could not help but wonder about the possibility of using the compounds directly on human beings with diseases of the blood. If nitrogen mustard attacked white blood cells, he reasoned, perhaps it could be used to control leukemia, the most common type of cancer in children, with its unrestrained white blood cell growth. And by using different dosages of mustard to destroy some, but not all of the cancer cells without hurting the patients. But when Alexander proposed an ambitious set of experiments, he was told by his chief and then by the National Research Council that that was not the job of Edgewood, Ar of Edgewood Arsenal. There was not enough time or money to pursue medical lines of investigation. They were in the business of national defense. He was ordered to put the project aside and return to his work on mustard casualty management, treatment, and decontamination. 
miracle cures would have to wait until after the war. But now sitting in a Bari military hospital 6,000 miles away, not even two years later, Alexander held in his hands inconvertible evidence. Mustard gas did, in truth, selectively destroy blood cells and blood-forming organs, he wrote. It had taken a freak accident and the massive exposures of wartime to verify in people the phenomenon demonstrated in laboratory rabbits. It all added up to the same conditions I had seen in my pre-war work, he wrote. Blood cells disappeared, lymph nodes just melted away. I remembered thinking, if mustard could do this, what could it do for a person with leukemia? Alexander could not save the worst of the mustard gas casualties. He knew, but perhaps he could make their deaths count for something. It was a one in a million chance that had landed him, one of the few doctors in the world who knew of mustard's curative potential, in the middle of a disaster with a morgue full of case studies. It was an unthinkably rare chance to perform a pioneering investigation into the toxin's biological effects on the human body, the kind that would be impossible with living volunteers. He ran down the hall, yelling for more blood tests. He made sure to take special care in preparing the specimens, hoping that they would make it across the long journey to America. He needed to be scrupulous in gathering the evidence, as much data as possible, in the short time he had left. He wanted his insight into the systemic effects of mustard to be entered into the medical record with an eye towards seeing whether the harmful substance could be used not to destroy, but to heal. On December 27, 1943, Alexander submitted his preliminary report on his 10-day investigation of the Bari Harbor catastrophe. The in the report, there were 617 Bari victims who had suffered from gas exposure. Of those, he documented 83 who had clearly died of poison gas. There were many, many others whose records would never be found. These were the first and only poison gas casualties of World War II. His report was immediately classified. Eisenhower and Churchill acted in concert to keep the findings secret, so there's no chance Hitler could use the incident as an excuse to launch a gas offensive. Any mention of mustard gas was stricken from the official record. There's a slide here of one of dozens and dozens of cables that went back and forth between the headquarters censoring any mention of mustard gas in the records. It was even stricken from the patient's medical charts. Alexander's name was removed from the, from the patient's medical charts along with his diagnosis of toxic exposure. It was replaced with the gener generic terminology for combat casualties, burns due to enemy action. The feared German chemical attack never came the Wehrmacht was deterred by logistical constraints combined with allied air superiority and the threat of massive retaliatory gas strikes. Ironically, however, the Germans had known all along about the source of the poison gas in the harbor. Nazi spies in the port had suspected that the allies were shipping gas. After the airstrike, they sent their own diver down and found the bomb casings, which confirmed that the weapon was American. Axis Sally, a popular Berlin propaganda radio host, had even taunted the Allies a few days after the air raid. I see you boys are getting gassed by your own poison gas, she cooed. British officials never acknowledged Alexander's report, but it garnered high praise from Eisenhower's advisors. They lauded the exceptional job Alexander had done under challenging conditions, but was but told him that a commendation was withheld for fear of offending the prime minister. The, the officer most impressed with Alexander's report was his boss, Colonel Cornelius Dusty Rhodes, chief of the medical division of the Chemical Warfare Service, who hailed Alexander's meticulous investigation as so complete and of such immense value to medicine that it represented almost a landmark in the history of mustard poisoning. Rhodes was eager to explore the toxic agent's therapeutic potential. Like Alexander, he believed the Bari data pointed the way toward a promising new chemical 
targeting white blood cells that could use, be used as a weapon in the fight against cancer. Rhodes, in his civilian life, was head of New York's Memorial, Memorial Hospital. It was the biggest cancer hospital in the world at the time. He seized on the wealth of new information provided by the Bari victims as a breakthrough. His ambitious plans for Memorial Hospital now converged with Alexander's report and crystallized into a single mission, to exploit the military research into poison gas to find a chemical that could selectively kill cancer cells. Armed with the Bari report and the results of a top secret Yale study, which demonstrated for the first time that a regimen of nitrogen mustard in tiny, carefully calibrated doses could result in human tumor regression. Rhodes went in search of funding to develop the experimental treatment known today as chemotherapy. He persuaded two men that made a fortune during the war, Alfred P. Sloan and Charles F. Kettering, the heads of General Motors, to endow a new institute that would bring together leading scientists to make a concentrated attack on cancer. On Tuesday, August 7th, 1945, the day the world learned that an atom bomb had been dropped on Japan, they announced their plans for the Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research. World War II was over, but the war on cancer had just begun. The official secrecy surrounding the Bari disaster continued for decades. The military refused to acknowledge the chronic effects of mustard exposure on hundreds of surviving sailors, naval personnel, doctors, nurses, and civilians, resulting in years of suffering, controversy, and lawsuits for medical compensation in both the United States and in Britain. In 1961, Alexander even volunteered to help the National Academy of Sciences conduct a study of the American survivors of the gas attack. But the project stalled when identifying victims of contamination proved too difficult. All their records just said burns to enemy action, Alexander recalled. They couldn't tell who had been poisoned and who had been blasted. In the epilogue, I explained in detail how the truth about the Bari incident finally emerged. It was no thanks to Churchill who continued to deny the presence of poison gas in his voluminous World War II memoir, Closing the Ring. Eisenhower was a little more forthcoming in his 1948 memoir, but he stated only that one of the ships was loaded with a small quantity of mustard gas. Unfortunately, the wind was offshore that day and quote, the escaping gas caused no casualties. The early attempts by writers to correct the record were not altogether successful as they did not have access to all the classified documents. Many of those early accounts were deeply flawed, riddled with mistakes and official lies. I found that even to this day, the confusion persists. If you go online tonight, for example, and try to search for photos of the Bari disaster, you will find many, many gruesome pictures. Unfortunately, most of them are mislabeled and they are in fact not of the 1943 air raid, but of a horrendous accident that took place in Bari in 1945 when another American Liberty ship, the SS Charles Henderson exploded. So it just goes to show that the whole incident remains muddled by misinformation, even in today's digital universe. Alexander was discharged from the Chemical Warfare Service in June of 1945 and returned home with a chest full of medals and a new bride. He turned down Rhodes' offer to work at the fledgling Sloan Kettering Institute and instead kept his promise to his father to continue their family practice in Park Ridge, New Jersey. He wanted to settle down and raise a family in the hometown where he had deep roots. He went on to become a much beloved physician and cardiologist and the highly respected director of medicine for 18 years at Bergen Pines County Hospital. He never spoke of his wartime exploits, but he always took quiet pride in his unique contribution to medicine. He did not mind that the details of his investigation remained enshrouded in secrecy. In a story full of twists and turns, I will not here reveal the final twist and the unexpected series of events that led to Alexander finally being honored by the army in 1988, 45 years after the fact. 
for his work in saving lives at Bari and for having a profound impact well beyond his patients in being a catalyst for the development of chemotherapy. Sadly, Alexander died on December 6, 1991 of a malignant melanoma, skin cancer, that he diagnosed himself. But over the years, he watched with keen interest the many trials and tribulations of Rhodes and his fellow cancer researchers, many plucked from the ranks of the Chemical Warfare Service as they struggled to turn a potent chemical weapon into a chemotherapeutic agent for the treatment of cancer. Sloan Kettering had to mo mobilize an army of mice and men for the trial and error search of the most beneficial der derivatives of nitrogen mustard, a chemical whose toxic effects could be harnessed to target abnormal or malignant cells without doing too much damage to the patient. The first nitrogen mustard extract, safe enough for clinical use, was called mustergen, and it was quickly approved by the FDA in 1949. Sloan Kettering doctors notched their first progress in treating adults with acute leukemia. In the early years, the remissions were few and fleeting and the nausea and vomiting caused by the aggressive treatment were terrible. Progress was slow and painful and there were many setbacks. But Alexander lived to see his wartime research into mustard gas lead to the creation of a new class of chemotherapeutic drugs, many of which succeeded in prolonging the life of patients and are still in wide use. By 1953, the new medicines 6-MP and methotrexate were shown to produce remissions in children with acute leukemia, the most common childhood cancer. Today, the use of combination chemotherapy, more than 90% of those children can be cured of the once fatal disease. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, also a fatal disease in adults, also now has a more than 95% cure rate these medical triumphs led the American Cancer Society to credit the Bari disaster with initiating, quote, the modern age of cancer chemotherapy. I believe that in the midst of this terrible pandemic and the race for a vaccine and a cure, Alexander's story is a reminder of how powerful the act of a single doctor with a keen eye can be. At the end of the book, I write, on the 60th anniversary of the first cancer chemotherapy trial, Dr. Jules Hirsch, the former physician in chief of Rockefeller University Hospital, paid tribute to Dr. Alexander in the Journal of the American Medical Association. He reminded readers of the Bari disaster and the inquisitive physician investigator who, quote, sifted through the horrors and extracted a gem, something potentially useful for the abatement of human disease. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for a fascinating, fascinating presentation and so important too. Uh, I've spent much of my career working on the First World War and one of the most powerful and disturbing experiences I've had is walking on the Western Front and seeing these uh, mustard gas canisters that are still lying out there on the ground in many places and they're still very dangerous. Uh, sometimes people step on them and they get splashed by this stuff. Uh, yes, they still keep surfacing um, from the muck underneath Bari Harbor and uh, dozens and dozens of Italian fishermen have been sent to the emergency room with weird burns on their arms from, from bringing them up with the fish in their nets. Wow, wow. They've got to be aware of that danger there too, I would think. Yeah, yeah. They, they have whole groups studying it still to this day. One of the things that's interesting to me, obviously this, um, in this case, the mustard gas came out in a different way than it would have in a deliberate attack on the Western Front. And uh, I was wondering, as you were talking, in accounts that I've read of uh, many thousands of soldiers who were exposed to this during the First World War, um, when they would get burned by the mustard gas, the effects were pretty immediate. Uh, maybe not instantaneous, but they, they felt them within a short time of the exposure, whether burning within their uniforms or burning under their helmet or something. And that doesn't seem to have been the case this time, if many of them were 
sitting in their uniforms and not noticing it so quickly. Why was that? That's because, you know, if you inhale it directly into the sensitive nasal and, and throat passages, you, you, you immediately have the effects. And most of the men that were close enough to do that probably died of their other wounds. But the men who jumped ship and swam to safety um, were covered in this cruel, crude oil that had mustard oil uh, leaked into it. And that weird mixture in their uniforms, um, when they were wrapped in blankets and kept warm, their skin, it, it was very slowly absorbed through their skin. Mm -hmm. So it had to penetrate their skin and then slowly penetrated their organs. So it was sort of a slow, lethal process. And, you know, one of the tragedies that, that Alexander pointed out in his report was that had a, the proper steps been followed and a gas alarm given, which is what, you know, military protocol calls for in a chemical attack, then they all would have been hosed down the minute they got to shore and they probably would have almost all survived. But because of the enormous secrecy and the unprecedented nature of the attack, um, you know, and in the chaos, that ensued, uh, that gas alarm was never sounded. And, you know, another thousand boys probably died unnecessarily. Would it be safe to say that if scientists looked back or uh, medical professionals, professionals looked back, which I imagine they could have done in 1943, 1945, at uh, those who had been exposed to gas during World War I, there were still many who had lived past the war, they would have found many dying over the long terms from the same effects, right? So yeah. after World War I, it's interesting, they, they started to do all these studies, but poison gas was so despised after World War I, it became such a hated subject that most of the you know, laboratories lost funding. Nobody wanted to, to look into poison gas, uh, let alone its medical effects. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It was something that people turned away with, with a vengeance after World War I. They were sort of almost on the brink of discovering some of its uh, effects on cancer, but um, there was no interest in that line of research in a way. So all of a sudden the Bari report combined with the Yale study made people go back to some of those World War I things and go, wait a minute, you know, we're seeing that it was, you know, uh, effective, and it, and they looked at these new stuff. They looked at the World War One information with a new eye. Right, and it it would make me think, just as you've shown here, that these casualties were covered up. The the men who died were covered up, forgotten. Their deaths were attributed to other causes, uh, inaccurately so. That this is yet another area in which there were forgotten dead from the First World War. He probably would have died within a few years afterwards from misattributed causes. The tra right. I, I go into it quite some length at the end of the book about the tragedy for the veterans. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boys. Remember, they're 20, 21 years old that were exposed to mustard gas and lived but their medical charts said burns due to enemy action. They would spend their life suffering from skin cancers, skin cancers, bronchial ailments, asthma, glaucoma. I mean, you name it, all kinds of terrible diseases. Then they not only never had them properly diagnosed, they could never receive proper treatment because there was no official recognition that there was a gas attack. And it took these lawsuits in the late 80s in England and, and, and 1991 in America before, you know, the information was really uh, confirmed by the governments and acknowledged that medical compensation was due. Now, by then, obviously, most of the veterans were dead or very, very old. So it was really criminal <laughs> what was done to those boys. They suffered twice. I was so interested in your description of Alexander's thought process uh, after this disaster and, and his beginning to suspect what had happened here, identifying the similarity with mustard. I was a little bit surprised, though, that he didn't immediately react to the assumption that this must have been enemy action, which you would think under the tensions of the time that your first thought would be the Germans have deployed poison gas, and then only later when you look at the evidence, you see that, no, that couldn't have been true. But in his case, it seems to have been a while before he considered that possibility. Is, is that so? I think because he, he knew that had 
been a German gas attack, he would have been told that right away. Um, the fact that he was that he was told this is some kind of weird uh, set of casualties, we're not sure. Um, you know, look into it. It was a very murky situation. Um, he knew right away that something complicated was going on. It wasn't obvious. Um, so uh, the other thing is, it was very clear to him almost immediately that from his, he'd done a lot of studying of what a German uh, aerial attack would look like. And the damage uh, from those bombers would have been much more extensive. And so it was bizarre that only, you know, even though it was hundreds of cases, that it was only these men that the, that, that workers on the docks didn't seem to be affected, you know. Um, so uh, it was a very puzzling and complicated situation. Um, but he was deeply shocked when the British suddenly blamed the Germans um, and he had to kind of go back and review all the evidence a second time uh, to make sure that he wasn't wrong. So that's one of the many great things about your book is how you, you bring Alexander's personality and really, I don't know if heroism is too strong a word up to the forefront and, and what a shame it was that that, that was not, not only was it not uh, commended, but that it was covered up. Um, I'd like to, we're at the top of the hour, so I'll, I'll end with this question from Sam Silverstein, uh, who asks, uh, how did you come about the subject of the story? I came late to your presentation, but what was your initial interest in this shocking story? Uh, my grandfather, James B. Conant, um, was one of the directors of the Manhattan Project, and his particular responsibility was for all chemical weapons. The largest chemical weapon, of course, being the atom bomb, but he was also responsible for all poison gas. So when I was writing my last book, which was a biography of my grandfather called The Man of the Hour, I um, was looking through all of his papers and I found reference to this group of poison gas casualties. Um, and I was not aware that there were any poison gas casualties in World War II, so I became kind of intrigued. Um, I was also intrigued that my grandfather immediately went on the board of Sloan Kettering, which seemed very odd to me. So I did more research and I really stumbled upon the Bari um, disaster and I became more and more intrigued. So I notified Dr. Alexander's family of my interest and they said, well, we have all of his diaries and his records and the telegram, <laughs> basically wow. a writer's sure. dream. And, uh, and therefore, uh, it was clear to me that I had to write the book. Well, that's clearly uh, one of the reasons you're such a popular and successful author as I look over your list is you choose great topics. <laughs> so, uh, and you're to be commended for this one too. Uh, Janet Conant, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, author of The Great Secret, The Classified World War II Disaster That Launched the War on Cancer. Thank you. Thank you.